having a pretty nice uh, cordial dialogue with a gentleman by the name of Sam Candy 64 on my uh, page that's talking about Titus 2.13 and how I believe that Paul is pretty pretty unambiguously saying that we're waiting for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, and the conversation has led to the question, you know, Paul was writing to a student of his, someone he's mentoring, Titus, and I believe that he's saying that we're waiting for the appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And I said, do you think that the apostles would teach the people that they were training up uh, after, for, after they were gone that Jesus was their great God and Savior? And do you think that they would teach, the, you know, preach at, at the churches that they were shepherding um, that Jesus was our great God and Savior? Um and here's just a little something to uh, kind of throw into the mix to chew over. Um, I, I want you to consider the church of Ephesus. Now, a handful of churches in around 96 AD got a little uh, checkup by uh, the great physician, Jesus Christ himself. And what did he say about Ephesus? Well, it's uh, Revelation chapter 2. It said, these words are... To him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you can to cannot tolerate wicked men. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name. You have not grown weary. Uh, then he critiques them that they've forsaken their first love. Their zeal is beginning to uh, um, you know, decrease a bit. He mentions you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. In other words, in Revelation 2, Jesus gives the church at Ephesus a pretty good doctrinal checkup. Um, you know, it's, it's later on, you know, and, and if there are doctrinally things wrong with churches, he will mention it. Um, let's see, I, I think it is, uh, yeah, the church of Pergamum, um, where he, he says... Um, I have a few things against you. You, te you have people there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, uh, sacrifice to idols, by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Um, so if there were doctrinal issues with churches, you know, when Jesus was going, you know, Given them their their good points and their bad points, he he mentioned if there were doctrinal issues, he didn't mention any doctrinal issues with the church at Ephesus. So let's move on. Now here's the uh, here's the crux of the matter. John lived. Uh, you know, the church of Ephesus was was swarming. I don't want to say swarming. It's kind of a negative term, but it was thick with apostolic presence. Um, Timothy went there and died as a martyr in the mid-80s. John basically retired there. And, uh, you know, around the year 101. So this, you know, apostolic doctrine was solidly at that church. So I want to take a look at the Church of Ephesus in around the year 106. This is a letter from Ignatius of Antioch as he was on his way to Rome to be martyred. Um, now, Ignatius himself, this man was ordained by Peter and probably mentored by John. He was, a, he was a close friend of Polycarp, who definitely was mentored by John. And uh, he's writing to the Ephesian church. Did the Ephesian church in 106, just a few years after John died, what did they think of Jesus? Well, let's take a gander, shall we? Um, chapter 7, the letter of the Ephesians where it says, beware of false teachers. Some are in the habit of carrying the name of Jesus Christ in wicked guile, yet they practice things unworthy of God, whom you must flee as you would wild beasts. They are ravening dogs who bite secretly, against whom you must be on your guard, inasmuch as they are men who can scarcely be cured. There is one physician who possesses both flesh and spirit, both made and not made. That's, that's The Greek is generato kai a generato, you know, uncreated. God existing in flesh, true life and death, both a bearing of God, possible than impossible, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that is the more accepted 
long recension, uh, excuse me, short recension of Ignatius. Um, there's another version, and it's no less friendly to Arians of chapter 7, where he says, um, Our physician is the only true God, the unbegotten and unapproachable, the Lord of all, the Father, and begetter of the only begotten Son. We also have a physician, the Lord our God, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son and Word before time began but who afterwards also became man of Mary the Virgin, etc., of the Word was made flesh. So either way, in chapter 7 of the letter to the Ephesians, there is Ignatius's belief and the, Igna and the Ephesian belief that Jesus was our God. I um, also want to bring you to chapter 18 of the uh, what the scholars accept, you know, to be the authentic Ignatius, uh, the long recension being the more interpolated version. Here's the shorter middle recension, as it's also known. Uh, Let my spirit be counted as nothing for the sake of the cross, which is a stumbling block for those who don't believe, but salvation and life, but to us, salvation and life eternal. Where's the wise man? Where's the disputer? Where's the boasting of those who are self-styled and prudent? For our God, Jesus Christ, was according to the appointment of God conceived in the womb of Mary, of the seed of David, but by the Holy Ghost born and baptized that his passion might purify the water. So clearly um, you have, excuse me, I'm about to run out of batteries here. I don't want to have to do this again. Let me plug my computer in. There we go. Um, yeah, clearly you have an apostolically throned church a scant few years after the death of that apostle with that church and an apostolic student in the form of Ignatius affirming that Jesus Christ was their God. Um, do, with this in mind, now I guess there's one of two things that might have happened. Uh, that you, I mean, you have you know, in 96, Church at Ephesus is in pretty darn good doctrinal shape. Jesus says so, says as much himself. Um, I suppose a few years after John died, you'd say, you know, apostasy went berserk there. And Ignatius, who himself was a martyr and a champion of the faith, he was also an apostate too, even though apostates don't exactly, wouldn't go to their death and uh, write letters to people, you know, telling them to stay orthodox and stay away from heretics. Or my version is that the church in Ephesus, which John was shepherding and, again, had a big-time apostolic presence there, believed that Jesus was their great God and Savior. And, just the way, and that's why I think Paul was saying that to Titus in Titus 2.13. Um... Just, just chew it over. Like I said, it's, um, you know, I, I don't know of any apostolically thrown churches just a few short years after the death of that apostle who believed that Jesus was a created God or a mere man, you know, or, or whatever you might think. Yet there is an apostolically thrown church and an apostolic student just a few years after that apostle's death who believed Jesus was very God of very God. Well, food for thought. I uh, hope to hear from you on this one, Sam. See ya.